Okay. Um, uh, uh, first of all, thank you all um, uh, for accepting uh, uh, to be here. Uh, it is a great uh, pleasure to have all you here. So uh, let's start with, uh, uh, I, I would like to just very briefly uh, introduce panel members, our special guests today. And then uh, we, uh, I will pass all to panel uh, panelists to talk about those uh, challenges in uh, uh, today's challenges in IoT, AI, and uh, security. Uh, uh, our panel members uh, uh, today we have uh, uh, Alirza Jolfai. Alirza Jolfai is a program leader and the lecturer from Macquarie University. And also uh, he's a panelist and moderator for this, for today. And also we have Piplo uh, Prey, senior lecturer in CQ University. And uh, uh, so he's expert in the cyber physical systems, AI and IoT. We have uh, also uh, Malka Halgamuj, if I am right, uh, researcher and IoT specialist uh, in blockchain and uh, IoT at the University of Melbourne. We have uh, Sam, uh, I think uh, Sam, uh, uh, let me check Sam. We have also Sam Mokhtari uh, uh, from uh, uh, data analytics leader and the senior solution architect at uh, Amazon, uh, AWS from Brisbane. Uh, and also we have uh, Vapa Shams. Uh, Vapa Shams is the head of APAC uh, at Wirepass in Melbourne. So we have uh, two uh, special guests, uh, one from Sydney, one from Brisbane and the three from Melbourne. And uh, it is a, a good combination of uh, academics and industry panel discussion. Uh, I would like to pass uh, all to panel members. Uh, please uh, welcome uh, also ask your questions in QA and uh, in or in message box. Uh, I will uh, pass all to panel members. Uh, you all uh, also you are welcome to ask your questions live and you can just uh, uh, let me know and I can uh, you can also unmute yourself and you can talk to panel members. Thank you uh, all uh, for uh, uh, participation and thank you also all our guest speakers. Just I will pass to our guest speakers. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much Sattar. And thank you for having us here. And I would like to thank our panel members uh, for joining us here to have a very timely conversation on data analytics and Internet of Things. Um, so um, actually before this meeting, I was thinking about um, the current affairs. I mean, the uh, stories that is happening all around the world COVID-19, the impact of COVID-19. So I thought that perhaps it would be relevant to this symposium and to all of us who are actually attending this webinar at the moment to perhaps have some conversations around the impacts of COVID on our research and on our um, work that we are doing at the moment. Um, so perhaps um, maybe I can um, start from um, Ray, that um, from your perspective, um, what were the impacts of COVID, I mean, on, on your research in Internet of Things? Um, well, I will start with the positive. Um, essentially, throughout the pandemic, probably one of the enabling uh, technology was AI, which made us went through all this pandemic um, and see us other side. Um, and as we know, 
AI is always um, work side by side with IoT because um, AI essentially can do a um, lot, but without automation of data collection, it's not possible. So that's a positive thing. And a lot of movement happened through COVID, throughout COVID, like uh, finding um, the movement of people um, and tracing, that's pretty much a contribution of AI. Um, so yes, AI and IoT has contributed a lot. Talking about my research and impact on it, um, probably from my personal point of view, it just l gave me a lot to think another different direction of life and told me how technology and uh, what we do with technology should be a blessings um, in many angles. So that's pretty much my thought how AI and IoT um, contributed and um, enabled us throughout pandemic. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Ray. So in your opinion, COVID has created lots of potential opportunities for your research in, in the domain. So let us ask the same question from Malka. And by the way, nice to meet you, Malka. It's a pleasure meeting you in here. <laughs> yes, nice to meet you. So actually, I had a problem with my, uh, my can thing. So the, uh, could you please repeat the question? I okay. didn't hear that question, sorry. So, so the question that I had in my mind was, um, you know, because now we are in the COVID era and somehow in the post-disaster management phase. So I was wondering what was the impact of um, coronavirus on your research and that you're conducting in computational intelligence and Internet of Things? Yeah, so there are a few things, actually a few areas some are more important at this moment, uh, especially telemedicine, e-health, uh, because telemedicine can change uh, because people know how do they, uh, how do we have more application during this COVID uh, pandemic. Because is it convenient even after the COVID situation, people use this one, uh, the telemedicine e-health and e-learning we are soon, we are continuously using and Australia did not stop teaching and learning. So, uh, and also most of our shopping will be done using online. So online shopping, e-commerce and virtual reality, uh, augmented reality, so basically, if you want to buy a cow house, you don't want to go there. So you can, uh, rather than you're physically going there, so you can uh, get the decision using this technology. So, and even future shopping uh, will be the mostly on and online. Even after COVID, there will be shops as well, but uh, uh, most people, they will use online uh, shopping. So e basically e-commerce, those things, there will be a, a uh, huge uh, 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 improvement on these, these areas. Thanks so much, Marco. You actually touched a very important area that people now know more how to use this virtual environment. Uh, people now know how to use online shopping and, and so on. So perhaps one of the good impacts of pandemic was that people, you know, getting used to more um, to use of digital technology as perhaps maybe before people didn't pay that much to that in, to the importance of that. Thank you so much. Um, so hi Sam, um, it's a pleasure meeting you here. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, hi everyone. <laughs> Sorry, I was actually, uh, I, I had a lot of problem to just nice. join the meeting. So it took me like five, six minutes. To, to <laughs> it's a pleasure having you here. So uh, I'm not sure if you were able to, um, to hear the question. So I can maybe repeat it one more time. We are actually talking about the impact of um, COVID on the research we are doing and on the work that we are actually conducting right now. And to my understanding, you're working at uh, Amazon services. So what was the impact of COVID 
um, on your um, work? I mean, did it increase your workload? Did it decrease your workload? Did it create more opportunities for you or not? So the thing is, uh, you know, like um, the COVID situation and all these uh, working from home situation. So it, uh, it's, uh, it needs like people and organization companies start to just move uh, to just use more like uh, cloud services yeah. and uh, like all these uh, virtual uh, types of uh, 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 things to run the meetings and all those things. So for sure, like um, it increases the, the, the amount of usage for the cloud services. But um, it was just one aspect. And also at the same time, although that uh, we are, I would say, at a very tough situation, but I, I see a lot, a lot of investment from different companies in different sectors to just uh, go to be more like uh, uh, digital and use like all these uh, new and cutting edge technologies uh, to just uh, uh, make uh, the, the, their companies, their organization more mature in this space. So, so uh, like for instance, if there is any new situation like COVID, so they are, I, I would say next time they're gonna be ready for, the, for that. And um, for sure, like uh, the thing is, uh, as I said, we are seeing a lot of investment and a lot of companies and other organization uh, try to use all these technology and um, that's where for sure like cloud would be uh, one of the key cloud computing services would be like one of the key types of technologies that they are using. And it's not just uh, limited to a specific sectors, all sectors. So uh, my background and my experience, um, I, I did a lot of uh, analytics and AI in across different sectors from mining, energy and transport. And in all these um, sectors, I see like um, companies are putting a lot, huge investment and uh, they are trying to just adopt cloud uh, and the services around that as much as possible. Yeah, yeah thanks so much, Sam. Um, it was actually a good point. The importance of cloud services that now companies are paying more attention to it. Um, so Vafa, let me ask you the same question <laughs> from your yes. experience in connectivity of Internet of Things, um, what were the impact of COVID really? I mean, does it improve uh, more opportunities for your business to explore, you know, more um, business opportunities during the, you know, COVID situation? I mean, what was the impact of it on your research and on your um, work area? So uh, thanks very much for that question, Alueza. So, so I guess, from my perspective, you know, like I will always use the uh, uh, the internet or, or, or other types of connectivity for uh, to work from home, uh, since I've been working from home for the last four years. So it hasn't been anything new. But but in terms of our customers, I guess the, uh, the the pandemic has shown that you know if you can do things remotely, then uh, I guess that's the safest. Option. So, so from an IoT connectivity perspective, I can, I can give you a couple of examples where this technology has actually been utilized. For instance, um, uh, you know, our technology can does allow for asset tracking or people tracking or, uh, or you know, counting tools or, you know, sort of tracking uh, assets. So it has been put to quite a lot of use in terms of heat mapping of people at the office and you know sort of uh, and then coming to the cloud side of things which is not our domain you know, I guess people have been creating applications and solutions to you know raise alarms and things like that um, if there is uh, you know too 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 uh, little proximity of people to each other uh, which is quite conducive to the to the passing of the disease uh, the other aspects, you know, is, uh, is another interesting use case has been, you know, the use of UV lighting, uh, which is used as a steril sterilization uh, sort of alternative within um, uh, small office um, and sort of workspaces. Uh, and then you use the connectivity to kind of um, uh, turn lights and on and off according to a uh, automated schedule and also reporting back to say, you know, this light has been illuminating this area for, uh, for a certain period of time. Hence, that area ca can be considered as, uh, as kind of clean. 
uh, you, you can imagine, you know, the type of applications that uh, that this type of technology can be put to in, um, for instance, in hot desking, where you need to kind of clean the area before another person uses that. So we can see more and more. Uh, I think IoT is going to to come out as a bulletproof uh, technology past the COVID uh, sort of onslaught. That's my personal opinion. Yeah, thanks so much, Rafa, for sharing your uh, insights on um, on um, the recent challenges of COVID on IoT connectivity. So from the conversation that we had with all the panelists, it seems like um, the COVID situation has created a positive environment for more research, for more productivity, and for thinking out of the box. And, you know, people are coming up with new ideas to, to, um, to facilitate the environment, to make things more interconnected, more tied together, and, and makes things keeps rolling and happening. Um, so the second um, question that I actually um, had in mind, and it can be a question from many of our audience who are now listening to our talk on this webinar, um, is um, a career perspective. Because I know many of our audience are graduate students who want to embark a new journey in the domain of IoT and data analytics. So um, I would like to ask this question from our panel members that um, in your opinion, um, what is the best way of career planning and preparation for the job market in the, in the domain of IoT and um, uh, data analytics? So let me ask this question first from Ray. So what do you think, Ray? Um, in terms of preparing for a career, see, the most important factor is uh, persuasion and keeping open mind, especially the way technology is shaping. Now, um, for a specific IoT and AI, yeah, I've been there quite a long time, but IoT is just shaping. Um, it's not even mid-age of maturation. Hence, uh, for anyone who wants to build career in IoT AI, needs to be uh, needs to have grit. Uh, grit is a very key term, and a appetite to learn rapidly and quickly, um, because what we know today may change after a month, a very different dimension. Um, hence, keeping up to date, having grit, and essentially, the most importantly, keeping an open mind is the key. Yeah, yeah. Um, thanks so much, Ray. So you actually mentioned very good point for or, you know, young, um, graduates that they need to keep their greed and appetite for learning and have the attitude to be the open-minded person that um, their future employer dreams of having them in their team and in their company. So uh, Malka, let me ask this question from you, from your experience, um, what is the best advice for somebody who wants to explore an opportunity in your domain of expertise? Yeah, uh, so mainly uh, you, need, you need to understand where and how, let's say AI can be, let's say if you, we consider technology, AI can be applied to support IoT and cybersecurity and what are the interconnection interfaces and role played by blockchain as well. So that that's the technology uh, a point of view. And, and you need, we need to find out what is your true passion and interest so you need to ask some question from yourself. What are the things you already love doing? And basically brainstorm yourself first and try to figure out what exactly you want. You can take a piece of paper and write down what are the things 
whatever the things come to your mind, you should, you should be able to write out and talk to other people and serve what are the other possibilities you have and basically practice and practice and practice some more. Never give up. This is always my motto for my students. Never give up. Thanks so much for your insp inspiration. And, um, and as um, you mentioned, it's very important to keep the passion and refer to ourself, inner or self, and see what we really want. And always practice and never be afraid of failure to achieve the success and dream job that we want. Um, so let me ask um, this question from um, Sam. So Sam, um, from your um, experience, uh, what is the best way, I mean, best advice that you might have for the graduates to explore new job opportunities? Um, all right. Yeah, that's, a, that's, I would say, a very good question. And um, based on my, my experience, you know, like um, I, I got a very deep academic background and also uh, I would say deep industry background as well. Uh, based on my experience, I would say the first things that uh, the grads should uh, start to work more on that is more like around some soft skill. They need to just uh, learn all these uh, types of uh, and all these methodologies and a framework that can help them be a, like I would say a, a high performing uh, a member of a team. So that's a, that's a very I would say key skills that can help uh, individuals to be successful in their roles in any company. So, and um, you know, like these are like more like how they need to just communicate, how they need to just collaborate with others. And uh, also like some um, methodologies that like, even like, uh, you know, all these companies is becoming uh, in, in this space are becoming more like a software company. And you need to know how all these methodology and uh, the way that people work on a, like a specific application or software. And th that's, that's, I would say, would, would, would be very uh, beneficial because at the end of the day, you know, this space is, it's, it's, it's huge. It, there are like a lot of domains, a lot of things, and you cannot uh, know everything. You cannot just have this uh, experience of working with all these tools, technologies. You just need to know how to, like, for instance, if you want to start to work on a project, you need to know how you can start from like initial idea, how you can collaborate with the other team members and how you can just um, uh, work on it. Like a very, I would say, small MVP use cases and then build on the top of that and then just collaborate and just continuously improve that. So that's, that's uh, I would say, it's some of the key types of, uh, it, it just, uh, it's a skill that you need to just learn and uh, when you have all those in place, I would say technology, it's like these days you can have a lot of, uh, I would say, enablement, e-learning, everything that's in place that you can easily just leverage. But those are the things that you, that's all very important and would be like, I would say, uh, some things that you need to just be success, successful in this, uh, uh, I would say, in this space, especially in, around data and analytics and IoT. Yeah, thanks so much, Sam. So from Sam's talk, I took three inputs that um, the space of the IoT is very huge and we need to keep working on uh, our soft skills and developing our um, teamwork to be a successful person in our future career. Exactly. Um, so um, let me ask the same question from Wafa. Wafa, you've been in this industry for over 20 years, you've been collaborating with many universities. You've been working with lots of in the standardization bodies in terms of IoT, networking, and so on. So what is your expert advice to um, our current and future graduates if they want to tap into the market that you're actually now working in? Yes. Thank you for that. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I have to uh, also support uh, everything what, uh, what every, everybody has said prior to me in this respect. I guess uh, we, are work, we are living in a world where I think software is eating the world. Uh, and then you can, you can judge that by the, the amount of success that uh, the software companies are creating. Um, 
a little bit closer to home, you know, we're working towards, uh, we, with a lot of partners, uh, sp in especially the design houses to, uh, who create uh, new products for, for organizations. Uh, Etc. So I can tell you that, uh, for instance, the, the design houses that we work with, they are getting a new project every two days in Melbourne. This is not in uh, like Singapore or is not in Silicon Valley. This is right in Melbourne, where people are, um, uh, you know, design houses are getting a new project every three days, and hence the the amount of resources that they require is also proportionally growing you know or even exponentially growing uh, so so of course we are focused in the connectivity part so in this respect i guess you know we need people who are uh, for instance embedded software developers you know they, they are quite a lot in demand and there is a shortage of them for instance and that, so so if anyone wants to 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 tap into embedded development i think there is a great career to be made in the next uh, 15 to 20 years uh, yeah I, I think it's all very positive uh, to say the least well, thank you Vafa for sharing your insight and experience from a software perspective um, and I hope that our graduate will consider your advice uh, for the development of themselves so from the panel members conversation my take was that uh, we should I myself should continuously continue to learn and improve my skills in my domain. So let me ask this question that um, uh, from your perspective and the area that you're working at, um, how can one, let's say a graduate, continuously develop his or her own skill to move forward? To, um, to widen the professional network. So, so maybe I can start this question from Ray. So Ray, um, how can our graduate student, or in general, we uh, continue improving our skills or development and so on? Um, thank you a little. Um, before I go to, um, go to the discussion of the particular point you have just mentioned. I, I just want to give one example, which is related to our previous discussion. Um, often um, graduates or um, some others or many of um, the students, they think in a direction that learning a set of uh, syntax is the way to go. Um, but actually, in industry, in my experience, and being in academia a long time, that's not the way to go. It's learning how to learn is the way to go. Um, nowadays, the interview is going in this direction or a practical interview where they actually open up the Google said, search whatever you want, solve this problem. And I um, designed and worked with a couple of companies to design interview where they, they don't care if you search Google, but within the time bound, it solved this problem. So hence learning the, the talk, um, one of us said soft is skill and people is skill is the key to be skillful in the technology. Now, going back to the question you just asked, how to do professional development or create the network. Um, based on my personal experience of the last 20 years, I realized that we learn through our institutions, not just the education. Maybe education is just 40% of total learning. It's 60% is getting the network done. Um, and that network essentially stays for forever if uh, we are good at keeping the network. And network is the one bring us forward uh, because I can tell you what I learned in my computer engineering, far-fetched, I used very little. Um, but I learned along the process, a lot of other things, which is built on that computer engineering base. Meaning in industry, they don't go in uh, base electronics, um, but rather build on it. So the network starts from the institutions by volunteering 
all the voluntary opportunity you may grab. And that can be even a little thing. Um, it can start by just doing or helping your friend. Um, so voluntary opportunity is the best way to build a network and start getting involved and being member of the professional organizations, especially um, the one which is just on the corner, um, like your student uh, group within the university or a focus group within the university, and most of the university or the school uh, provides those um, for all students. So th these are essentially two pathways. But the third and um, most well, one of the most important would be your community library or uh, the community space around you. They, mean, they need a lot of volunteers um, and they are always looking for one. Um, so this is the, th that, that's the third sport is should get involved because community professional network and throughout that PD is the way to go. Yeah, thanks so much, Ray, for um, raising interesting points that uh, we need to learn how to learn and we need to um, improve our engagement with voluntary work in our local community to expand our reach and network you know such as IEEE for example you know you, you can try to get more involved with the community so Malka let me ask you the similar question so from your experience what is the best way that we can move forward and we can keep continuing developing our skills, in your opinion. Yeah, thanks. I think Dr. Craig uh, provided uh, almost all the answers. Mm -hmm. However, on top of that, again, I, I uh, reinforce, uh, be prepared to embrace and learn something new, never heard of before, perhaps during your studies. For example, in my, uh, uh, my point of view, I, I have never formally studied blockchain before. But now I do research, my own research, and even teach others blockchain. So there's a small example. So we need to keep growing. So we need to commit to a, and also commit to an attitude of uh, lifelong learning. And as we, uh, the Ray uh, mentioned, sign up for short online courses that builds your, uh, your existing skills. And for example, this conference itself is a very good example. We conduct many very, very important workshops. This is a, so those are even free service, but you need to enroll for those courses and you need to get the additional skills that complements uh, of uh, the first qualifications. And also you need to develop your personal branding. For example, LinkedIn is a very good example for, uh, for that part. So expanding your professional work. So it's crucial that build your personal brand as a networking. So, so those are the sub points. Quite inspiring. Thank you very much, Malka. So as you mentioned, we should all make ourselves committed to a long lifetime learning. And we should also try to maintain our online presence, like having um, a good profile in LinkedIn, and actively being engaged with what's happening in the world, both physically and virtually. Uh, so let me ask the same question from Sam. What do you think, Sam? Uh, yeah, I totally agree with uh, what uh, Malka and also Ray mentioned about uh, uh, continuous learning. Uh, we got the, one of our key principle here in um, Amazon that we got is just, uh, uh, we got this concept of uh, learn and be curious. So that's one of the key principle. And then um, I would say definitely, as you can see in the technology space, uh, all these e-learning, we got like a lot of contents. So there's all these opportunity if you want, if uh, anybody wants to learn. But the thing is uh, what uh, I wanted to just emphasize is that uh, learn by doing things. Uh, just um, otherwise you can just go and just open one of these online learning and then after one or two months uh, you don't know what what what, what did you learn uh, and you cannot even like uh, um, uh, you cannot even remember 
how was the the way that Lachman that specific e-learning was provided. Uh, so the thing is definitely if you want to learn something, just put put it in a way that you can do and just experience and then learn. Otherwise, you know, like all these, uh, um, our brain model is in a way that if you don't do it, it just the chance that you lose that it's very high. So definitely if you want to learn some skill, do it in a way that uh, it's going to be consistent and also persistent so that you can just uh, later on for any other opportunity that you may just apply that skills. So you still can like uh, remember it and also you can just apply it. And the other things that I wanted to emphasize is that around the, the fact that uh, uh, all these skill sets, uh, it's good. But the thing is, uh, just you need to know how to apply it. You need to know how to solve the problem. And that's, I would say, one of the key things that you need to learn. And uh, that's, that's the, the important part of, uh, uh, to just, I would say, uh, to use all these potential skills and just make it more applicable. Yeah, thank you very much, Sam. Um, and pointing out that um, learning process can be a little bit complex, but it's a very rewarding experience. And as you pointed out, we should try to maintain our perseverance to, to be able to cope with the learning process. And whole life is learning by itself. So um, we need to keep learning. And as Martha mentioned, we need to be committed to this um, long lifetime learning. Uh, so let me ask you the same question, Vafa. From your experience, um, what are your insights on um, the learning itself? And how should we improve ourselves uh, in the domain of our work and our research? Yes, and it's a bit unfair. All this intelligence before me uh, picks up all the good answers. So by the time it reaches me, there is uh, hardly anything to say. But if I, if I, if I were to add something to this, uh, I would say, you know, this area of work, you know, the IoT um, is, is very broad. You know, it starts from a hardware to software to, to connectivity to big data to cloud to machine learning to, to um, you know, so many other things. But then the good, the good thing about that is that uh, we are at the infancy. So we have only started to, to tap into the IoT. So just, just imagine, uh, I guess we, we think that, you know, when, when the human body can, um, the, the amount of genome that uh, exists in the human body is just uh, beyond the imagination. And with the, even with the most, uh, intelligent IoT devices, they only handle a couple of uh, bytes or kilobytes of data. So we have only started to do this right now. And so, so that means that there is just enormous amounts of maturity and development yet to be had, uh, which is great for anyone who's just starting to, 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 to start a career in this, uh, in this field. I mean, my, my, uh, my advice is uh, get a bit pragmatic you know, get a few other things like, you know, nowadays you can buy a Raspberry Pi and a module to start developing things with a few hundred dollars, even less. There is just enormous amounts of the resources on GitHubs and open source that you can just download free of charge and develop something, you know, just to, to, to practice your skills. And I think that that wouldn't go straight. Uh, thank you very much, Rafa, for your advice on being more pragmatic and being yeah. more vigilant in terms of using online resources and available resources that we have in our surroundings. Mm -hmm. um, so let me ask you a more um, um, a specific question that perhaps I'm sure many of our panel members would like it more because it relates to your area of expertise. Um, as you see nowadays, when you know, there is a lot of conversation about um, digital citizenship, or there are lots of conversation about uh, smart cities, that all of the technologies like Internet of Things is trying to provide this platform of connectivity so we have a better experience of um, you know, citizenship and um, while we are living in a digital city. So with respect to your area of work and expertise, 
how does the, your research, how does your work contribute to providing a better opportunity or let's say, um, or how does it contribute to uh, digitization of services inside a smart city? So Ray, let me ask you first. Um, sorry, I missed the last part of the question. What is it? So, so how does your research contribute to digital services in a smart city? Um, so probably this um, will, the, the question comes from two direction. One, how my research, my research is most on urban areas. Uh, sorry, remote areas um, uh, for remote community because I more focus on IoT uses in remote communities. But for urban areas, probably at the moment, the way I see it is yes, we should essentially create um, global citizens who are smart, but I find it very, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, problematic of a spread of the technology without a standard management or regulation. Because yes, we should enable citizens um, and in urban areas to make a smart city, but aren't we creating so many, so much, and uh, the, the confusion world for citizens to rather pushing them reverse direction See, if, if uh, we are talking about IoT, um, AI, blockchain, we have so many manufacturers, so many technologies. And uh, for someone who wants to get just a smart home done, um, they can buy one from a provider, but that's not a holistic solution. No one has a holistic solution for a smart home. Now they go to another provider and they get confused they don't know where these data sets. Um, they don't know how to manage this uh, data. So probably um, I would say the first step and, and that related to my research is to get the user their confidence to IoT uh, before it's too late by giving them a sense of uh, privacy of their information, which we, uh, the, this all um, smart city technologies are collecting and give them a notion of their own identity kept on their own private way. Um, but probably that's a very important step to take to get uh, citizens' confidence towards IoT, hence making them global smart citizens. Thanks so much, Ray. Um, so what is your take on it, Malka? It seems Biplav, um, Ray is mentioning that um, the digitization actually created a lot of mess, a lot of problem. And this big movement, because it hasn't been coordinated well, it has created a lot of problem in terms of the use of the technology and uh, also in terms of the privacy and security. So what is your opinion about that? Yeah, so yes, that's, that's right. So uh, that gives us some more opportunities to explore further, for investigating these areas. So simple way my research focuses on integrating IoT and blockchain for secure industrial automation. That's the simple way if I, I can explain my research. But more specifically, my re recent work focuses on adapting major blockchain platforms to support computationally constrained low power IoT devices and modifying selected lightweight scalable consensus protocols for low power IoT devices to secure real time data collection and communication in an autom uh, automation environment and exploring blockchain mechanism to deal with cyber risk related to IoT environment and designing smart contracts for device-to-device -device interaction to enhance security and privacy of uh, IoT devices and cyber infrastructure. So that covers, I think, uh, pretty much uh, uh, everything for the secure automation 
uh, for your team. Okay. Thank you very much for sharing the highlights of your research, Malka. Um, so let me ask um, the same question from Sam. So Sam, in your opinion, um, I mean, did the recent digitization has created mess? I mean, is there not a lot of problem when we are using IoT because people don't know basically how to use it? Or perhaps many companies are trying to make new technologies so fast that they forgot about the security and on other issues that might happen as a use of this new technology? Um, so the thing is, you know, this um, uh, space, I would say analytics, IoT, um, I don't want to say we are at very early stage, like, uh, but the thing is, uh, we are still not enough mature. Uh, the thing is, like, uh, if you see the software engineering practice back in 1990s. So like that time, uh, uh, like we, we didn't have like, I would say enough maturity in that time for like all these automation, all these security and all those things. And then slowly after like, I would say 10, 15 years, uh, it, it become very mature. So like the team are very high performing. They are doing, uh, they are collaborating properly. They, they have a lot like, of, uh, services and tools that can help them to just uh, streamline all these processes that they got. So we've got the same story, I would say in this space as well. Although now that uh, we see like um, a lot of organization, although that they know like that the data and all those things that can come from IoT or any other types of sources, uh, that, that it can provide value. But at the end of the day, you will see there are like, uh, th th there are, they got a lot of challenges and um, they have like a lot of problem with some aspect, but uh, I would say it's normal. Like uh, I would say in five, 10 years, you can see how uh, they, they, they slowly become mature and mature and then they, they, they get uh, the most out of their, uh, the, uh, out of the, the data that they got. And uh, it's, it's a journey. It's not a, just a one off I would say, job that you can say, okay, next day uh, my, my company or my organization are like uh, data driven, no. It's a journey and it's going to take time, but uh, definitely the, you can see like even like over the last two, three years, we are like, I would say in very good, uh, good situation and it, uh, it's continuously improving. And we will see, I would say five, 10 years, this space and uh, all the organization are like, I would say there are another Google, another Amazon or uh, like high performing culture, people working together and then they can get the most out of their data. Yeah, thank you very much, Sam, for sharing your insights about the maturity of this new technology. And it's good that you, we all believe that um, this new technology is going to become more mature, perhaps by the next five to 10 years that we can see less of these problems that we see nowadays. So Wafa, um, what do you <laughs> think about this problem? Um, what is your insight about this? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm extremely optimistic because, uh, and I think it's good to, to step back um, a few steps to see, you know, like uh, what other technologies or connectivity technologies that brought, for instance, the connectivity technologies that allows us to use smartphone and some of you are already using that for even accessing this. I mean, that was an enormous opportunity that brought to the foreground, you know, for uh, the likes of software engineers and you know, students and uh, and professionals in this area, or the technologies that connected, you know, the internet. I think they are just massive uh, benefit to the uh, to the industry and and to the society. And you know, thanks to those technologies that we can uh, work from home in in the times of pandemics and you know, sort of keep away from. Uh, the perils of 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 being of having to work in in small proximity, but when you think about the the IoT technologies that uh, you know the next wave of connectivity or the next generation uh, networks, you know, just imagine. I, I mean, I I I, I'm a, I I tend to think very simply. Uh, I think everything that can be connected will be connected. Uh, and, and because the, this, this type of uh, connectivity will bring quite a lot of challenges in terms of delivering scale and density and performance, uh, that means that you, know, you need to uh, 
uh, you need to work on decentralized architectures. So, so I think the um, devices will have to connect themselves. They have to be autonomous, you know, so, so they actually take control of their destiny in terms of self-forming, self-healing, self-provisioning, uh, and they will have to be out of the box. Uh, and then the challenges in this type of environment, when we're thinking about scale that goes to trillions rather than billions, uh, then is uh, is cost to scale. You know how much does it cost to scale to that type of um, numbers? Uh, you know battery efficiency. You know can we have devices on batteries that can work for the next twenty years? Because no one can go and uh, refresh those batteries out of those those number of devices and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but I think these are the challenges that the, you know, the current generation will have to rise to and deliver solutions to. So, so I'm extremely positive. Yeah, thank you very much, Rafa, for sharing your highlights and your optimism on the um, connectivity of Internet of Things. Um, so um, I think now perhaps we can um, you know, ask the question that our audience have um, asked us here. I can see a couple of questions on the Zoom chat. Um, so I apologize to all the audience because I have to randomly pick one of them. So I just try to pick the last one. Um, and, and the question is, how can Internet of Things contribute to evidence of identity, um, particularly during the COVID time in, for example, in financial industry. So how can uh, Internet of Things can contribute to evidence of identity? Maybe I can ask this from Ray. Um, it's a question um, which comes uh, very close to the existence of IoT. Um, so the, if I understood the question well, um, how IoT can be evidence-based of an identity? Yes. And that's where actually the answer I gave earlier, um, to get the confidence of consumer, we just need to make sure IoT device gets um, their identity a lot more secure. i give you an example. Um, you set a, an IoT device with an um, hardware address or app ID through a middleware. That can be changed by anyone. Um, now, I own that IoT device. Anyone can own another parallel one with same app ID. It, this, especially if we are talking about consumer owned, which is not B2B. B2B equipments are different. They have a different level of uh, protection. I'm talking about consumer-centric IoT devices. And that's where a lot of work needs to be done to ensure those identities are protected and not stolen to give the consumer confidence. Solution, I don't know, blockchain-centric um, solution are uh, trialed in many by many researchers. Um, that could be one, but then these devices are very, uh, very, uh, what do you call, um, a little capable in terms of processing capability. That's the, and, and battery, as, a, as we are talking. Hence, putting any type of security measure gets a serious issue in this type of consumer-centric devices, not B2B. So Thank that's my take there. Thanks so much, Ray. So let me ask the same question from Marco. She mentioned a couple of points on, um, uh, on um, I think, on online shopping and so on. So how can IoT contribute to the um, to this problem, to um, evidence of identity in that domain? Yeah. So uh, I would think uh, it's uh, uh, perhaps uh, the on top of the what Ray said. Uh, a public key infrastructure platform, PKI. So automate the process such as certificate distribution, but at the moment those are centralized process. Uh, using blockchain, we can do, use the distributed uh, uh, PKI platform that could be a 
uh, another option. Regardless, I just ignore the uh, battery capacity of the uh, devices. Uh, regardless of that, uh, but the uh, public infrastructure platform uh, it could be a, a, a one uh, avenue to explore on that uh, using a blockchain uh, distributed PKI. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Marka. Uh, so, what is your take on that, Sam? Uh, to be honest, if I want to answer this, I need more context. If uh, it is just more about the identity and then the way that you can verify the identity. So, like for instance, if a person is using an interface like the mobile phone to just uh, do like the, some transaction or whatever that's if if that's the, the the identity that the person who asked the question is referring so that's like you know like we have like a lot of uh, types of sensing technology that we got there and depends and we are seeing even, even like uh, i work with some of these uh, financial services in australia and uh, they are trying to just implement some level of uh, like uh, identity verification for 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 the person when they are trying to just use the any types of interface whether like through the web app through the mobile application so fa face detection or even like the fingerprint all those things that, that all those sensing and measurement that's happening there it just tr trying to provide a, a verification of the identity and uh, or like even to some extent i know like there are like some research happening to just uh, see how they can just uh, uh, do the identity verification through the through the behavior of the person and the way that they're interacting with that interface. But that's another story. It's I would say more in the research domain. But if uh, you go beyond the industry, not the specifically financial, uh, I was actually like uh, back in 2014. I was doing like some research around this uh, how you can just use IoT and. Uh, like some types of sensors to detect and, uh, and distinguish uh, individuals. And uh, it was like that the use case that I was working in that time was more like on the smart home and how you can just uh, uh, distinguish individuals uh, in the home. And then based on that uh, identity, I would say detection, you could just uh, like uh, provide services to the resident of the home. But that's, I would say like, a, uh, it's a, like a very vast and uh, big, uh, a research area and I see like a, uh, a lot of uh, universities and also companies are actually working on that and that's that's actually based on the domain and the sector and that based on that domain and sector got like a, a different use cases. Thanks so much Sam. So what is your take on it that fast? I wanted to be a little bit of mindful of the time. So yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's going to be huge in terms of uh, the context, various contexts. Just imagine, I'll give you a, a, a real example. Uh, so, so tomorrow we set up a, a cryptocurrency, which is based on the generation of solar powered um, electricity. So in a way that, you know, if, if I can show that, you know, I'm tokenizing electrons from my solar panel, which is really installed on top of my roof, uh, so hence, I need to demonstrate uh, the proof of origin that this is really my electron, is not nobody else's electron. Uh, so, so imagine, you know, this type of identity, uh, which is where, where a, a cryptocurrency, a, a new coin is built on this type of uh, origin, uh, has to be definitely secure. And um, uh, I guess, you know, everyone's before me has said the blockchain is providing that type of um, you know, assurance. But I think this is an area that uh, is, can be researched at infinitum because we, don't, we are no longer uh, sort of restricted to identity of people. We are, we are now talking about identity of things where we have to, to also demonstrate the identity of things. So, it's, so this is an ever expanding area. Yeah, thank you very much, Wafa. At this point, I think we are almost near the end of our panel conversation. So I would like to deeply thank all of our panel members here for committing their time, putting their time, and sharing their insights with all of our audiences. And thank you again for your attendance. And I also would like to thank all of our audience for um, being with us here today. 
And I hope that we could um, share some of the highlights of what's happening at the moment in the domain of data analytics and Internet of Things. So, um, Sata, I will now hand this session to you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, uh, all. Uh, very great uh, discussion. And um, thank you. It's great uh, to uh, have uh, you all here. And I would like also to thank you all, uh, uh, our audience, uh, for your great support during this symposium. Uh, we are going to have a post symposium as well events and also the closing ceremony. And uh, thank you so much for your great support during the whole, these uh, eight weeks of the symposium. And uh, I wish you all the best and keep uh, safe. And uh, see you in our other uh, in other uh, symposium and closing ceremony. Thank you so much, all. <laughs>